You're listening to What The Four Podcast in association with Viper Goalkeeping. Today's guest is currently one of the SPL's most imposing and impressive centre-offs and is now a fully-fledged Scottish international. Mr Declan Gallagher, how are you doing my man? You alright? How you doing mate? Thanks for having me on. Really appreciate it. It's your first podcast, isn't it? Yeah, it's my first podcast, so I'm a bit nervous, so don't, <laughs> don't judge me when I start pausing and don't know what to say. And things like that. At the time of speaking... Totally fresh news, which is totally scuffed at the beginning of the interview and I had to rewrite my questions this morning. But there was a meeting today with the SPL. Uh, the season's been called. Celtic like a champions. Motherwell a third. Um, how are you feeling about it? Absolutely delighted. Uh, it's been a long, hard season for us. So to get third place, it's, it's absolutely it's a great achievement, especially everybody knows that we've probably got one of the smallest budgets in the league. So to, to get third place in the amount of clubs, obviously big clubs that play in the Scottish League that have got much bigger budgets than us and probably expected to be in the position that you were in. It's just a testament to us and the club and what direction the club are actually going in. Yeah, absolutely. When you look at the, I mean, everyone looks at the, the Celtic and, and the Rangers side of things, but there's some clubs in there like Hearts, who you know have gone down this season. You've got Hibs. There's a few different teams that you've got there that have got bigger, big, bigger budgets, sorry, than Motherwell. I mean, it is a real testament to like this season. And I think, you know, to be honest, I don't think anyone would begrudge you with it. I really think you've deserved that third place. And I think had the eight games been played, you would have got into third place anyway. So um, sense of achievement now, time to sit back, kind of like reassess and go again next season then, with a bit of an extra break. Uh, well, you would like to think it would be time to sit back and maybe say I'll be at a wee third place, but the fact that we've had about eight weeks off now from football, it's been, we've kind of had a break at the same time we're still trying to work hard on fitness, so it's, it's all still up in the air because of this pandemic, but uh, no, I think I think you have to celebrate it a wee bit, it's still been a hard season, uh, yeah there was eight games to go, but we sat third place for most of the season, so um, I, think it's, I think it is well deserved. Uh, it was obviously very tight between us and Aberdeen. There was only a point in it. We had the game just before the pandemic that got called off. So, obviously, they might feel a wee bit hard done by. Uh, but it was a tight season between us and Aberdeen. I think the both of us were pushing for that third place. Uh, they beat us at Motherwell. We beat them at Pataudry. So, it, it was a good battle. But uh, I'm delighted that we, we have come out on third place. And I think it is well deserved because I think we stayed in third place for the longest period of time so uh, no it's been well deserved now obviously maybe have a few celebratory drinks with uh, the wife later on but uh, no I think I think realistically we're more thinking about trying to get back into the football now instead of taking time back to reflect I think we'll try to get back into it and uh, think about the next season ahead Absolutely, mate. You personally, you know, you've had an outstanding season as well. I think um, I was making you blush this morning on Twitter, but I think Mikey Stewart put it best. He said, uh, he put you in the team of the season. He said you'd really stood out as a leader and someone who could be depended on for Motherwell this season. And I think the reaction from Motherwell fans that I had when I said that you're going to be on the show just proves how good of a season you've had. But how much have you enjoyed this season personally? Oh, I've loved this season. I thought uh, the season before with Livingston was great. Uh, but instead of getting seen as an individual at times, sometimes it was always just me, Halkett and Lifko. We were yeah. just getting tired as a, as a back three and how well we were doing. So there was no individuality there. But I think this season I've, I've grew into my own, uh, playing a four at the back and being like one of the mainstay centre-backs. It's, uh, it's definitely changed my perspective for everybody else, I think. I think, obviously... And the season I've had and the, the plaudits that I'm getting and stuff like that, it's, it's amazing. I never expected it when I actually signed. As I've said, uh, the season's been a, a dream come true. We're obviously getting the call up and Motherwell being in third place and now being 
kept in third place. Obviously, the season finished. So it's been it's been a great season for me personally, uh, and obviously, I just have to thank everybody at Motherwell for that because they they gave me that stepping stone from Livingston to push on again in my career and basically bring out my individuality quality. When you look at um, your partner as well, you're talking about partners that you had at, obviously at Livingston as well, who were well thought of, but Peter Hartley's a Sunderland boy. Um, someone I, I actually saw his entirety of his, I think, five minutes on the pitch for Sunderland, but I know he's a big Sunderland fan. How much have you enjoyed playing alongside him? Oh, I've loved playing beside Pete. Pete's a great guy. Uh, he's, he's a great captain. That's the best way to describe him. He's in the change room. Anybody that needs anything, he's there for you. He's just that. He's a great guy. And me and him, we built up a good relationship uh, through the season. We travelled with each other to the training ground every day in the cars. Although the gaffer did tell us that we were meant to be going on the minibus at least one or two days a week to keep it mingled. But me and Pete basically just travelled constantly together. So uh, we learned a lot about each other that season. Um, I learned a lot about his 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 playing career, um, his times at Sunderland, we used to tell him a good few stories about like Sir Roy Keane and him as a young boy and just, uh, it was great honestly and to, to play beside a guy that's obviously played at Stanford Bridge and stuff like that against Chelsea's and played against massive clubs down south and had the kill he's had, it's, it's been great and it's, he's, he's actually taught me a lot on the field as well with the way he talks during games, he's, it's just an incredible leader on the park and it's it's one of the reasons why I've played so good this season because having a partner beside you talking through the game sometimes it's, it's a massive help. I think with um, Peter as well, you know, if you look through his career progression and you look through your career progression as well, it's, it's quite similar in senses. You've had to kind of start at a big club, take that knock back and build yourself back up. Does that help when you've had like similar pathways? Do you have an understanding as well with that also? Yeah, you just get a lot of stories that are, that are very similar. Like uh, all the stories you could imagine. If you've been at a big club, everything's great, everything's amazing. Uh, you've got all the facilities, and then as you say, you take that knock and you have to go down the divisions. But it makes you that wee bit more hungry in the game. It makes you want it that wee bit more. Some people go the opposite way. Some people think, ah, oh well, it, it didn't work out at Celtic, so I just need to let it go and that's it, my career's over on this, but nah, there's, there's definitely there's always a way up, back up to the top and I think uh, in my career I've proved that and I think Pete's obviously proved that in his career as well. Uh, both of us have had really good careers. Uh, hopefully I've got a wee bit more to my journey because I'm not as old as Pete, but I'm lucky Pete, sorry for saying that <laughs> mate. But, <laughs> but no, as I said, it's the stories that we tell each other in the car and stuff, it's just it's really, really great and um, no, I have similar careers. I think the both of were kind of very similar in the sense of how we played the game, how we spoke to each other, and just how we are in the changing room is a is a massive thing. Now, anyone who listens to the podcast will know that I like to start off on kind of recent stuff, which has been basically coronavirus for the best part of three months. But um, going all the way back to your sort of early career, obviously uh, you started at Celtic as it was, but we, you were born in Rutherglen, is that right? Yeah, yeah, I was born in Oregon, yeah. Because Wikipedia gets me so wrong so many times, and that's the extent of my research, such a Wikipedia. Literally, that's the extent of my research, which is terrible to admit, but there you go. But who did you support growing up then? Were you, were you Celtic or Rangers or, or neither? Uh, funny enough, it was actually, when I was when I was growing up, I was about, maybe about four or five, and I, I've, all, I've actually had a picture back there, but I don't have it now right enough, but I had a picture and I had a full Rangers kit on. Uh, that was that was because they, on my mum's side of the family were, were Rangers fans, basically. So yeah. uh, I was basically, I used to stay a lot with my grand and grandpa, obviously Rangers fans, and uh, my mum was a Rangers fan. So in the early years of my life, I think they were trying to sway me that way. Then when it came to the time of starting to, to play football and uh it was like my mum and dad having a lot of influence on me. My dad was a massive Celtic fan. So I started swaying towards Celtic. Then I started going to the Celtic games with my dad. And it was just, I used to go with him and his mates. And I can remember, just used to, it was back in the days when you were able to take seven and eight year olds into a pub and sit them in the corner and just tell them to <laughs> just be quiet. Say nothing. And, and Those were the so, days. Yeah, I used to go there. <laughs> 
I used to always go down to the, the sun in pub in Cameron's Lang and uh, he would meet up with all his friends. They would get a minibus together, We'd go in the minibus with them, and then they would all go their separate ways. They all sat in different parts of the stadium. Me and my dad's mate, Mick, would uh, go to the turnstile. My dad used to just lift me over the turnstile. Uh, it, was, it, wasn't even a, it wasn't even where he was where he would pay for a ticket. It was, he would lift me up to his pal who was on the other side. They two would have tickets. I just lifted up over. And then I used to sit in my dad's knee at the games. So that, that's how uh, I started. And I, I was a Celtic fan from there on, basically. It's funny you mentioned that because like, I've got exactly the same experience and I bet there's so many people around sort of our sort of age and you're a little bit younger than me but we'll we'll let that fly um, that have kind of similar sort of stories for that but the first experience I ever had at Glasgow and anyone who is listening and knows that I I spent a decade in Glasgow and just recently moved back was actually the Gallagher that was the first experience that I ever had in in Glasgow and I went into a pub it was I think it was called the Squirrel Bar I just went to meet a mate who's Oh. Yeah, the squirrel is well known. <laughs> oh, it was. I had no idea what it was at the time, and my my friend was up uh, seeing a seeing a band at the Barrowlands, and he's a big Celtic fan, Sunderland and Celtic. And he, uh, he says, "I'll oh, come down to the you know the Gallagher. I know you've just moved there. Let's let's have a pint." He says, "Yeah, no bother." So I put squirrel bar into my in my Google Maps, whatever it was at the time, about eight nine year ago. Um, Got into the into the bar, and what I didn't realise is I was wearing like a royal blue V-neck t-shirt as I walked in the bar, and the entirety of the bar just like kind of put their pint down and just went. And I thought, <laughs> oh no, what have I done here? But I escaped. I lived to tell the tale. I was all right. So not many people have escaped. I have to tell the tale to be honest. So <laughs> I was lucky, mate. I was very lucky. But I, my my mate kind of went, "Are you are you stupid?" Like. Do you know what this bar is now? It's like, well, I do now, but I'll just go home and change, but I'll be back in a bit. But yeah, good, good first experience, mate. That's all about experiences. It is, it is, mate. So obviously you started at Celtic, and I've got to be honest, I was sort of looking through your early career when you were at Celtic, and it's fair to say that you've been on the pro team um, since those days because you've, you've grown oh, a bit. Yeah. But uh, what was your pathway to Celtic? Um, pathway to Celtic? Well, actually, I started off at Livingston. Funny mm-hmm. enough, and I was about, if I can try to work out the ages here, it's a hard one for me, but when I was a young boy, I started off at Livingston. Uh, and basically, I think I was maybe about 11, 12, and used to get the minibus through, used to get picked up at the Showcase Cinema in Uddingston, uh, Coatbridge, yeah. sorry. So I used to get picked up there on the minibus, went through for training on a Tuesday, Thursday night, sometimes Friday nights. I uh, would train there. Then used to play on a Sunday, it used to be, but back then you were able to play for a boys' club as well. You weren't, it was pro youth, but you were still allowed to play with your boys' club team. So on a Saturday, I used to play for Livingston, and then on a Sunday, I used to play for Blantyre United, which was on our mates in school and stuff like that. So I used to play two games, so football was just constant. Uh, it got to a stage where Livingston ended up going into a bit of trouble. And then they had a big overhaul and it was uh, like say, Graham Robertson and Alec Cleland and stuff like that yeah. came in to Livingston at the time. Uh, I had I was actually captain of the season and that end of that season I ended up getting released from Livingston. Uh, I was actually promised the world at one point, oh, you'll make it to the first team. I said the next time, let's stay with us because I had a few offers the season before from the likes of Hearts, Motherwell, Hamilton and uh, Rangers because two of my old coaches at Livingston ended up signing the scouts at Rangers and wanted to take they took a lot of boys from Livingston to Rangers uh, the triplets that were at uh, Livingston at the time went to Rangers Mark Lear, uh, Kyle Hutton was at Livingston and then went to Rangers so yeah. they took a lot of boys that were actually in the Rangers team from Livingston but I stayed there getting promised the world and then the next season I ended up getting released. Uh, as you said, I wasn't exactly a big, I was tall, but I was a big gangly thing and my pace back then wasn't the, wasn't the greatest. So uh, they made the decision to release me and that's when I ended up getting my move to Hamilton. Uh, obviously just round the corner. I'm, Hamilton is a youth team. My professionalism was unbelievable. They had... I think they were one of the first teams to have most of the technology at youth level. Yeah. They had heart rate monitors and basically everything they had. They had the gym work. And back then, it was, I was a full new world to me. So I ended up signing there. And uh, 
they progressed me massive where I was there from under 15s and that that's I was only there one season and I basically played under 15s 16s 17s 19s and reserves all in the one season uh, they were basically they were great for me but because I had such a good season I was progressing the way I was progressing playing like four or five age groups above me Celtic obviously came knocking on the door Tommy Burns ended up meeting with my dad and a Frankie and Benny's uh, <laughs> I told about this at the time because I was doing my exams at school so I remember just having a maths exam and I was coming back and I was walking around with my grands and uh, my mum was there and uh, she's phoned me she was like where are I says I'm just at the exam I'm walking around now and she was like oh, hey, come around here I've got something to tell you and that and I, okay so walked down to school got to my grands and and I'm sitting there, big beaming smile and stuff like that. I sat, it was so, so funny and that. And she was, oh, do you know where your dad was last night? I was like, no, I said, where was he last night? He was, oh, I went went to Frankie and Benny's. I was like, all right. I said, to go to Frankie and Benny's. <laughs> and I was like, ah, I go for a meeting nearly sell today. And then she was like, no, no, he had a meeting with Tommy Burns. And I was like, ah, but Tommy Burns for Celtic, Tommy Burns. And he was like, yep. And I was like, ah, Right, I say if you get something tells them at this point I'm kinda of holding my breath now, I'm sitting here it's happening. <laughs> ah, well Celtic have just offered you a three year contract, uh full time contract. So I was just like, oh, my god, you're joking. And I was basically at that point the full place had erupted, my grand my grandpa, even though they were Rangers fans, they were open for me. So uh it was to be honest, like they my mum, my grand, my grandpa they've been my biggest fans, like, as well as my dad. So every one of them were ecstatic for me. And that's where I ended up signing a three-year contract full-time straight from school with Celtic. And you pretty much played in... I mean, I was looking back through the, the side that obviously won the... I think it was the Youth Cup uh, 2010, I think it was. Yeah. Looking through yeah. the team there, there's, there's loads of players that have gone on to play not just for Celtic, like across the SPL. You've got... Uh, I think Callum McGregor was on the bench a couple of years below you, but... Uh, James E. Forrest, and then you had uh, James Keatons was in their team as well. Um, how much could you see how much talent you know the likes of McGregor and Forrest had even at that kind of young age? Yeah, definitely. James E. at that age group was unplayable. You couldn't play against him; he was too fast. He literally, I can remember a time when we went to a tournament in Villarreal, and uh, our group it was a it was an actual annual trip. So years before this teams would always go back to Valley the house for the year we went over our group was the Japanese under 20s team Real Madrid and AC Milan was our group stage and I can remember the first game being against Real Madrid and I remember just Jamesy getting the ball and he kicked it by four players and just sped past them as if they were there and got the centre half centre half for the last man tackle because he couldn't catch him he was unplayable he ended up winning play of the tournament uh, so even back then it was phenomenal and everybody could see that he was he was levels above. His pace was incredible. He was it was just hard to play against and to have him in your team at that age group was fantastic for us. Is it weird and having it like full circle now, by the way, with him like both you've been part of the Scotland setup now? Is it kinda of weird that you have to defend against him again or do you kinda of wish you didn't have to because of the quality that he's got? Well, I can actually remember the first game, uh I think it was just before we went to um, my first Scotland call up. We played Celtic at Celtic Park, and uh, I've tackled him in the box. I've actually I've won the ball fairly great tackle, but I think he's basically slipped and fell on top of his ankle. And when I ended up going away at the Scotland camp, he was saying to me, "I hey, try those and stuff like that." I was like, oh, come on, man, me and him are really really good friends when yeah. we were that Celtic together. Uh, me, him, and it was uh, Michael Doyle that's at Falkirk. Yeah, had a good relationship with each other at the club. Uh, so now we're, we're really good friends. And um, to be honest, I got on with both of many times that I've been in Scotland as well. What were the senior boys like at the time? Because I'm trying to think who would have been there. I'm guessing it would have been, or well, was Brownie there at that point? Would he have been a senior yeah, bro? Yeah, he was there as well. Samaras um, and stuff like that. Samaras was there. Samaras used to give me his boots. Uh, he used to get that many pairs of boots sent to him he used to always just give me his boots uh, it was amazing to be honest because uh, when you were at Celtic you did used to get three boots 
from yeah. Nike. It used to be the big Nike tempos of about square, the, the worst pair of football boots ever. But when you're, when you're a young boy and you're getting three pairs of boots, you're just thinking, I feel, oh my God, this is amazing. But I like the first team boys at Celtic. They used to get boots sent to them all the time. Boys that had boot deals and stuff getting boots sent to them. And if there was a player there that was lucky to be your size, uh, you would sometimes be lucky enough to get a few pairs of boots. So Sam and Ash obviously been the same size as me used to always give me his boots. The only problem was Samurai used to wear vapours. Uh, as a centre-half, wearing a bright pair of orange vapours and a bright pair of pink vapours, as Samurai used to wear. Disney go down too well when uh, Chris McCart was the head of youth and he was a centre-half that wore black boots and metal studs that they had about this big and stuff like that. So it was, uh, it was hard to wear them. But wearing them in training was no bad. Yeah, you think you think what you can get at that age? I think that would be exactly the same. I'll just paint them, just paint them, just get a marker pen out. You'd be all right. You'd be yeah, fine. Yeah, marker pen and just start drawing them black. Yeah, it'd be all right. No one would notice. You had your loan move to to Stranraer, which was third division at the time as a teenager. Uh, I think looking back in hindsight, how important was getting regular game time, even in the third division of Scottish football, your progression as a footballer now? Yeah, massive. It was massive for me. Uh, I remember getting pulled into New Lennon's office and he basically said to me like there wasn't really much chance of me getting into the first team at that point there was about I think it was about six and a half at Celtic at that point and uh, he basically just said to me I think it'd be good for your career if you went out and started playing man's football uh, it's not really not really going to progress you too much just playing reserves and play against maybe a 17 year old one week and then potentially a chance of playing against like, proper men that have and making a career out of the game. So I, ju- I jumped at the chance to go and play under Keith Knox at Stranra. Uh, and it was probably the best decision that I made because it also helped me after I left Celtic as well. Yeah. Uh, because I boys obviously haven't played first team football when you get released from Celtic or Rangers or wherever you get released from. Sometimes it's hard to find a club because you've got no first team experience. You've only ever been playing reserve team football and it's it's just not the same. So uh, getting that first team experience with Stranraer was definitely vital to my career. With Celtic as it was, I, I don't know if you were then released or whether you just moved to Clyde, but was it were you released or did you just move to them and, and end your contract in that sense? No, I had a meeting uh, I had a meeting with Neil Lennon and basically it was a good meeting. Uh, obviously, it's not the one that you want to hear. But uh, it did say to me, I think uh, you need to go out now. You're, I think I was about 18, 19. Basically, said to me, I think it's about time that you go out there and experience first team football. He says, uh, you've went out, you've done it at Stranra. Uh, I can't really guarantee you any first team football here. So I think it's probably best for you, for your career, if you maybe moved on. And at the time, it was obviously a wee bit heartbreaking because you think, oh, it's the end of the world this uh, next time but it was probably the best thing to happen to me uh, I ended up leaving Celtic and it, it was quite good because I ended up then going down and having a trial at Yeovil uh, I had a trial at Yeovil so I spent most of my pre-season down there and then played in a game a trial game which was which was hopeless because it was 11 trialists playing against a conference team that had played with each other years. so I just thought to myself well I'm obviously going to get beat here and it's just that it was just me good yeah. so I played my boys that maybe weren't the up to standard and then some boys were good but went down there done that it was decent uh, but nothing came of it ended up meeting another agent down there that said oh, I'd like to take you into Doncaster and try I thought you'd done really well so I ended up getting a trial with Doncaster as well but in between that Danny McGrain from Celtic phoned me and basically said uh, Patrick Thistle would like you in on trial you fancy it and I said aye so I went in and then I think I was going to get offered something there but I said to Jackie McNamara was the manager I said to him that I had a trial at Doncaster so I'd like to try my chances down south and uh, see how it goes uh, I went down south tried it out and nothing came of it again obviously another bit of experience so I played with players like Billy Sharp was at Doncaster at the time uh, so again playing with players like that Testing myself down south, I played against Carlisle and I think it was Macclesfield in, a, in two games. 
which are done well in. But again, that came a bit, come back up thinking that maybe there's something in the party, but they just signed Stephen O'Donnell at the uh-huh. time. So it was small. So basically, I was limited in my choices for trialing. So I ended up getting a phone call from the Stringer manager. And he basically said to me that it would match my wages that I was on at Celtic. Uh, as a youth boy and stuff like that if I came in part time with them and then I got a phone call which I wasn't expecting from Jim Duffy and he basically said like Kevin yeah, thought you were amazing we're trying to build something here at Clyde uh, I'd like you to come play underneath me uh, and I basically I thought to myself well I know all the boys at Stream R so it's probably easier for me to go to Stream R and they were offering more money and stuff but my dad said to me, my dad was like, this is Jim Duffy, Dick. Jim Duffy was a Premier League manager, done great things at Dundee. He said, Andy's a centre-half like you who played at a high level. He said, you have to go work under this guy, you have to learn for this guy. He said, no disrespect to Sean but they're not going to do that for your career. So I took my dad's advice on board and went and worked under Jim Duffy and he done exactly that and he did promise me that if I played well for him, he would get me my move and to be honest, I done really well for them, and he ended up getting a, a move to Dundee that summer. When you went to Dundee, obviously, I think it was what you were there one season. Was that right? Yeah. Um, sorry, um, I meant uh, like Clyde, uh, Clyde. It was one season, then you moved on, though, doesn't it? You only had like the yeah, season at Clyde and jumped up. Yeah. Well- and uh, signed a two-year deal at Dundee. That's right. Um, so obviously it's a step above because I think at the time they were, that was the season Rangers came out, I think. Yeah, no, it was basically what happened was Dundee got, the season before Dundee got 25 points deduction, but they still finished that season in second place. That was just the season before I signed there. It was like the defiant season for Dundee. Yeah. But they had the administration, they had to play Boys were playing without pay. Some boys, my, actually my brother-in-law, uh, my brother-in-law played in the team as well, Craig Robertson. He was a junior player at Lockheed and he went and he was a massive Dundee fan. He had a testimonial and gave all his profit to Dundee and stuff like that because all my wife's family are massive Dundee fans. Uh, her dad was a director there as well. So uh, he actually played in that defiant season as well. Uh, playing from junior levels and played three or four games in that defiant season. So when they ended up finishing second that year, so when I signed, Rangers got liquidated, which meant they had to go back down to obviously the third division. And then they said it was either between the team that was getting relegated or the team that finished second in the championship that yeah. year. Dundee finished second, so they opted to do the team that got second place, got promoted. So Dundee were invited to be the 12th team in the SPL that season. So I uh, ended up coming, signing for Dundee, thinking that I was going to be playing in the Championship, to then signing for, from Division 3 to an SPL team. It was crazy. Some jump. What, what's the difference in quality like? Do you feel it straight away? Uh, well, from third division to the SPL, you definitely feel it. Yeah. You definitely feel the physicality of the game. Uh, I was still obviously still learning, uh, but obviously Jim Duffy had gave me a good recommendation. So it took me a wee while to find my feet at Dundee. I didn't really get as many games as what I thought I was going to get. I had a really good pre-season, but as soon as the announcement came out that we're going to be in the SPL, I started being a wee bit, I'd say it was a wee bit more panic buy than yeah. like buys where we were, we were buying people more on the the, the experience that they had in the SPL we'd signed the likes of David Grassi Colin Nash and don't get me wrong good good players but they didn't really give boys that were there the chance that maybe they deserved or well not so much me but there was other boys like Kyle Benedictus Neil McGregor and other boys that were there that maybe didn't get their chance as much as what they should have been there for seasons before that but that's kind of what happens in football you need to expect the unexpected so uh, it was it was hard, so I didn't really make my breakthrough in Dundee until about Halloween time, October yeah. time at all. And that was technically, uh, well, it would have been your first relegation that you'd ever had because I think it went down at that season. Now, I've always wondered, being a Sunderland fan that is used to being relegated on a regular basis, um, when you get relegated, right, it's the last game of the season um, and then you've got a couple of months to think it over, but how long does that take to get out of your system and kind of 
flip your mindset and go right back up next season? You just it's, it takes a wee while to be honest because anybody that says it doesn't affect them to be honest because it does it's it's a massive it's a massive confidence killer basically yeah you think about you're in the SPL and then you automatically think oh am I not good enough to play in the SPL and then you think back to the season could I've done certain things better and it's just like you, you play mind games with yourself but obviously at that time I just don't think that we were prepared enough. We didn't have this, the same amount of time as all the other SPL teams to prepare properly for going into the SPL season. Like, as I said, there was like panic buys and we didn't really know our, our start and living because it was a, basically a new team at that time as well. And we were prepared to go and win the championship. We weren't prepared to go into the SPL. But the fight the boys showed towards it, and to be honest, there was a wee bit of, uh, I don't want to go into it too much, but the game that relegated us, there was a wee bit of a, a turning point. There was a supposed dive by a certain player uh, that basically relegated us. Or else, who knows what kind of pressure we could have put on teams towards the end. Because towards the end, we could see the teams that were above us starting to wobble a wee bit. And we were picking up good results. We were, we'd beat Hearts at home. Uh, we'd beat a good few teams. And we were getting, uh, we beat Kilmarnock as well away. So we well, were well, doing well and there was a chance to probably catch somebody but a dodgy decision basically put us down that year I'd probably say because who knows what would have happened if we would have pushed on another week. And with those results that you had obviously and stuff like that and you do have that time, like you said, you're going to have those couple of weeks where you go and it hits your confidence but you were never present the season afterwards and obviously you won the league. So obviously something went right during that summer for the team as a whole and yourself individually but winning the league winning the Scottish Championship being an ever-present where does that rank in your career achievements? Oh it was massive I mean, it was an unbelievable season as well uh, I think obviously the team that we had built was built for the Championship we built that team for the Championship and it proved it that season where we went down and played in the Championship because we were more great and uh to be honest, it, it was very, very close. There was three teams that could have won the league on the last day of the season. Obviously, us, Oakirk and Hamilton. And then, obviously, coming to the last game of the season, you're winning 2-1, but then you hear that Hamilton are winning 10-2. So a draw wouldn't even be enough for us because they beat our goal difference. We beat Morton 10-2. Yeah, so it was, I do uh, remember that. Yeah, it was it was crazy so it was it was a crazy season but to be honest it was a season that was that's unforgettable and that last day of the season winning 2-1 the final whistle going the pitch invasion that had happened it was crazy I can, I can just remember Kyle Benedictus jumped on top of me so I was holding him up in the air and then Kyle Everton the goalkeeper jumped on top of the both ears and then the next thing you know it was just fans everywhere it was, it was carnage literally couldn't get into the changing room for at least about half an hour trying to get through all the fans after the game had finished uh, by the time I had got into the changing room basically the floor was covered in champagne beer whatever whatever else was getting through a bit in the changing room at that time you could have swam in it so it was uh, it was unreal and it's it's a time in my career that I'll never forget it was unbelievable <laughs> um, as it was though the, the season that you had with Dundee I think as far as I'm aware you had a contract to speak um, which ended in you moved to, to sort of Livingston. Um, was it ever your plan to, to leave Dundee or is, is that just football? No, it was, um, as I said, I grew out of, I grew out of, obviously, I loved Dundee basically. I ended up meeting my wife up here. As I said, her dad was a director as well. But at the time, uh, obviously, I had three different managers. I had Barry Smith, I had um, Bomber Brown, and I had obviously Paul Hartley. Uh, when Bomber was a manager, he came and he offered me a two-year deal. Uh, so basically, there's, there's been a lot of people speculating about like, why I left Dundee and this and the next thing, and people saying that I thought I was too good and that I wanted to leave for something bigger. That wasn't the case. I got offered a two-year deal. And when I got offered that two-year deal, my agent was wanting a large sum of money from Dundee for other deals that he had done with Dundee that he said they'd never get paid for. But Regardless of that, it should never have done that to me and never put me in that position. So me, obviously this is another life experience for me, but me for being a nice guy and my dad 
uh, we sat down with Dundee and we sat down with uh, two of the directors and the chairman and stuff at the time and we basically said, listen, my contract runs out at the end of the season with my agent. So for him, being the way he is, because we offered him his money, he wasn't happy with it. He wanted a larger amount than what he was actually due. So I basically said, well, I'll wait till the end of the season, I'll leave my agent and then I'll sign the contract by myself. That way you don't need to pay an agent's fee and we move on to there. I had a handshake with uh, Scott Gardner, shook hands with my dad uh, and that was that. Then Paul Hartley became the manager with 10 games to go and he basically said that all contract talks or whatever was put on hold till the season was finished. I just thought, right, okay, no problem, that's cool. Uh, won the league, played every minute of every game, done everything that I could for the club, loved the club, uh, thought I was signing a two-year deal, had a meeting after the season ended, and Paul Hartley basically told me that I was getting a one-year extension. He told me that I was getting £50 more than what I was on already, but Dundee were taking my house in allowance off me. Obviously, being a Glasgow boy, I had house in allowance and I stayed in Dundee, so I didn't have to travel. So he took my house away from me, which would have put me in a worse off situation than I was the season before. And so I felt that I had a two-year contract waiting on me. There was a gentleman's agreement, I saw the next thing, and it was never honoured. So for me, that proved a lot about people at the club, not the club per se, but it spoke a lot about people at the club. Um, my wife's father offered as a director to pay for my accommodation and stuff like that but I said at that time I said no because obviously there's people higher up that aren't interested interested in me at the club and don't value me and also at that time I didn't feel that Paul Hartley valued me when I told him about the two year contract he says well we're going another way we're going to be looking at signing big players and this that and the next thing and I said well I was a big player this year and I feel that I'm not being rewarded for that and the simple case is, they basically said, well, it was a take it or leave it. And I said to him, well, I'll leave it then because you obviously don't want me there. There's no point in going and playing the manager that really doesn't want you there. And I think he I think he kind of proved that to a lot of boys. Obviously, Dundee did do well, but he proved to a lot of boys that was in that team that stayed that he, he wasn't a very honest man to them. Yeah. Uh, but... At the end of the day, sometimes you have to do things in your own career. And I felt that I made the right decision at the time to leave Dundee because obviously I didn't feel that I was uh, appreciated enough for the, what I did that season. And then again, it was back to square one. It was back to try to find a club again. And then I've got things coming out in the press, people saying that, oh, he thinks he's better than what he is and he's going to England and he's doing this and he thinks he's better. But me being me, just kept my mouth shut, just got on with it. I love to have went out in the press and told my story, but again, it doesn't work and it just looks as if you're a bad egg. So just kept my mouth shut and then signed for Livingston. Yeah, and it worked out because obviously Livingston went really, really well. Um, obviously, it's definitely part of the progression of where you find yourself now, which, as we said at the start of the show, Scottish International, fully fledged. Um, you ended up sort of staying in the Scottish Championship as it was at the time. Um, despite being part of that Dundee side, but you know that's been explained. But there was also rumours of um, like links to English clubs as well. Was there ever a chance you could have went south as opposed to signing for Livingston? Uh, at the time, I heard it all before, like getting the agents calling you saying, "Oh, I've got this, I've got that." And again, no, nothing ever materialised. I always seen the interest, I always seen paper talk, I always seen that, but never ever anybody come up to me and saying, "Oh, there's an offer for you there." So. Realistically, when I when I went to Livingston, there wasn't too many other choices on the table, to be honest, even for the season that I'd had. Uh, but the money that obviously that I was on and stuff like that, there wasn't too many clubs that were matching Dundee's wages at that time. Mm-hmm. So I ended up, when I did sign for Livingston, I ended up staying in Dundee because that's where my wife and I was from. And I used to just commute to Livingston every day. And I signed for Livingston on the same wages that I was on at Dundee that same season that I won the championship, even though I was offered that same deal by Dundee. But I just felt that Livingston wanted me and Livingston were pushing the boat out to offer that kind of money, whereas Dundee were just saying, well, just accept that kind of money. So 
I'm no money, I'm not money oriented. So signing on the same money that I was on the season before was fine by me. But it was fine doing it for a club that wanted me. Yeah, not for quite a, a feel wanted. Yeah, quite not for a club I'm interested. So it was a, it was a right decision for me. I'm really disappointed though that you said your dad didn't make the chairman in the Tony Macaronis. That would have been superb. Uh-huh. Frank and Benny's the Tony Macaroni. <laughs> <laughs> To be fair, Livingston weren't sponsored by Tony Mack at that point. It was, uh, oh, who were we? I think it was Energy Assets. And then they were sponsored by Crafty Brew. Didn't and, have quite uh, the same ring. Yeah, doesn't have the same thing if you met him in Crafty Brew one day. <laughs> <laughs> I was at the, uh, you, you played Sunderland in pre-season. I think you were playing that game. I think yep. uh, we, we won 3 0, which is rare. And I went down to that, and as it was at the time, and it always makes me laugh. It always makes me laugh. I'd been in Scotland a few years by that point, and I got off at Livingston, I think it was Livingston North, and I said, Oh, I'll just walk, it's fine. Like, I just walk to the ground, it's no bother, because most grounds are quite close. And I thought, ah, It's not too far. So I spoke to this guy at the co op, I think it was, as you come outside of the, the Livingston train station, and I go, Is all right, pal, where's um where's the, the stadium? And he was just like, Livingston. I was like, ah, oh, you went, the spaghetti had. And I went, the spaghetti had? What? And he said, like, Tony Macaroni. And I was like, mate, that's incredible. I kind of believe you just referred to your stadium as the spaghetti had. And he went, it's about an hour that way. I went from laughing yeah. to just being like an hour. And he was like, yeah. And I just walked through like loads of greenery, but good day. But random story, totally off topic. Um, did you play with Sparky that year then? Were you with Mark McNulty at Livingston at that time? No, I didn't play with uh, Sparky at that time. No, he uh, he got his move. Uh, he come by then? I, yeah, he'd been gone by that time. So I would have loved to have played with him right enough. What a striker that would have been to play with. But no, unfortunately, I didn't play with him at that time. Um, I think that was a Livingston side as it was that at the time ended up being sort of relegated. But when you look at the team, there was a lot of players in that Livingston side that went down that ended up being part of that team that had the double promotion as well. I think one of the ones we're sporting about already was Craig Halkett. He was part of that squad as well. Um, was it, even though you got relegated in the first season, was it quite a good unit of boys that you had sort of in there? Or was it just kind of one of those seasons where things didn't work out? Is that how it spun around because it was such a good unit? Yeah, every time, I've, every year I've been at Livingston, it was always a great change in them to be in. Always a great change in them. Uh, it was just why they once, just things never worked out for us. Uh, I think it was Matt Butch who was the manager at the time and obviously David Hopkins was, uh, was the assistant and just we weren't playing bad it's just things just weren't clicking and just nothing was really working out for us and, but it was, a, it was a great group of boys like honestly like, and obviously we got Craig Halkett and on loan from Rangers and you can see how well he done yeah. and then it was excellent and playing beside him it, it was great so, uh, no, but it was always a great changing room. But every season I've been at Livingston, it's been a great changing room. Uh, I can't lie, it's probably been one of the best clubs I've been at, that's, that's for sure. But before I go on to the next question, like, and before I venture into the next period of your career, I want to specifically state we're here to discuss football and literally football only. But, you know, as some people know, there was time that you had away from the game, and time, a time that I'm sure you had much reflection. But I just wanted to ask, sort of, when you did come back and you had that reintroduction into the game with Livingston, what was it like being back on the pitch after that time you had away from the game? Oh, it was a, it was the greatest feeling ever. I can just remember that it was a, it was a Monday. Uh, phone phone Livingston up. Basically, I was just like, any chance I can come back in, start training? No, oh, I like come in, uh, come in. We'll see how you're on that. We'll see how you're doing. So went in, started training. And then on the Tuesday, I spoke to David Hopkins. He was just like, it's good to see you, big man. Good to see you back well. He said, how are you feeling? you feeling sharp? I said, well, I've been training with, with Rovers the last uh, four or five months. So feeling fit, feeling ready to go. I said, but you can judge me on training and stuff like that if you like. So went out, trained, done well in training. Looked as if I'd never been away. And then uh, went back into the room they just said to me it was like uh, right big man we'll, then we'll get you signed up and we'll, we'll get you back into it so ended up signing on the I think it was a Tuesday signed on the Tuesday we had Wednesday off and then on Thursday I came in and they said to me well, are, you, are you ready to play a game and stuff like that and I said oh, you don't know how ready I am to play a game I said I'm desperate for it and they said right okay so we done team shape and then it found out that I was I was starting, they played a, I think it was a back three they were playing. 
In fact, Sean, it was a back four and they played Craig Halkett at right back. They had Sean Crichton, they had Alan Lithgow at centre back and then they had it was Jackson Longridge at left back. So, come back in and they said, right, we're playing Peter Head away. I mean, what a game that is to come back in there for the bus. So, uh, I was just like, right, okay. So, I, I thought, I honestly thought, right, I'm going to bench here. I named the team and it was Sean Crichton was playing right back, me and Craig Halkett centre back, Alan Lifko was playing left back. And his thought process was, they've got the big boy Ronan McAllister up front. So we're going to go with a big back, big strong back four. So use four, just stay at the back, be solid. And then we had the likes of Rafa and Sean Byrne and Liam Buchanan all up the, up the top end of the park for this. So just like that, right, okay, that's fine then. So we end up going up there. I think it was about the 60th minute or something like that. I couldn't believe I was back on, but I was getting knackered anyway, that's all I knew. <laughs> I got to about the, the 60th minute and uh, it was me and Mark Miller were just the two new signings in me and Mark Miller and uh, he put the corner in and I just when I actually see it was as if it was going in slow motion for me I could just see the ball come in I'm thinking I'm getting this here and I said this is my ball all day long and I can remember seeing the goalie coming out his goal and I thought to myself he's never getting that ball and I thought oh this is, this is mine and the next thing I know it's just it kind of sped up at the last two settings. I was hit my head and it's went like top corner. And I was like, oh my God, I didn't even know what to do at that point. So I've kind of ran towards the corner. And then the next thing you know, Rafa De Vitas came flying on top of me. And then it was like a big pile on. And I think then that's kind of when I knew, right, I'm, I'm back. And this is what I'm going to do. I gave the wee kind of two thumb point to the name on the back of the tap as if, right, that's me, I'm back. So after that, I've never looked back and it's, it's been unbelievable. A uh, world one, as you could say, my career. Yeah, most definitely, mate. And I think you know when you look at the um, you know the header that you you put the header in, you scored, hits the back of the net. I imagine there's like a moment where any kind of issues or worries that you had about coming back onto the pitch, that moment, I suppose, it hits the net. You just they sort of they go into the past for you, don't they? You kind of can yeah. move forward. It's like a state. It's like a statement, and you put in you're putting the market down like that's it, you're back and you haven't really looked back since then. As you said, mate, it's been very much a whirlwind and absolutely a progression since then. Um, not just with Livingston, just your own personal career, you know what I mean, which we're now talking about today. You'll be playing European football next season as well. Uh, you went and jumped actually two divisions um, in total from that time when you were under David Hopkin. What was David Hopkin like for you as a manager? Because obviously he was with you at a really pivotal point, not just in your career, in your life as well. Yeah, no, he's been great for me. He was absolutely great for me. The, the first minute that I walked back in to the minute that he left and stuff like that, was great. Uh, really loved working under him. Uh, a lot of people used to always criticise the way he played, but realistically, everybody, every team's got a game plan. Yeah. And every team sticks to their game plan. Just because we were a little bit more direct at times doesn't mean we were just a long ball team. We could play football as well, but a lot of teams didn't like the fact that we were physical. We used long throw-ins. We used we used everything that we had to get the results that we needed to do. And, and at the end of the day, it worked for us. So why should we change just because you're all these teams that think that Barcelona are turning and saying, oh, we don't like the way you play? Well, you're sitting second in the league. We don't care. <laughs> I spoke, don't care. To a, <laughs> spoke to a few Stoke players who played along the times of Rory Delap, and I'll tell you right now, not one of them complained about it. And some of them went to World Cup, some of them played in Europe, some of them played for really big clubs that played wonderful football. Not one of them have complained about Rory Delap and his long throws because it won them games at the end of the day, and their fans were happy. Exactly. If it wins your games, it was, but well, it was great. And don't get me wrong, I had my fallouts with, with Hoppy a few times. Uh, Two big, big characters in the changing room, the both of us, and sometimes I just don't know when to keep my mouth shut. So I end up shouting. I can actually remember a time where it was after a game, and I let the ball bounce. Uh, and Derek Lyle for Queen of the South has gave me the wee nudge and caught under the ball, and then he's ended up dinking the goalie, and we lost 2 1 to Queen of the South. And I can just remember getting out of the change room, the hockey's going absolutely mental at me. And I'm thinking to myself, oh, God, okay, just sit here, take it. And just kept going on and on and on. It was by day ones. I was just sitting there and I'm thinking, right, major point, leave me alone now, please. 
that, it's no happy style. Happy style was make sure he knows. So, me, I probably say it wasn't the greatest thing I'd done, but basically, when we kept on going on, I ended up turning and telling him to F off. I was like, yeah. ah, we're having that. So, then me and him, I'm there, and I've gone heat to heat to each other in the changing room. But as I say, these things stay in the changing room and stuff like that. And these things happen in football. That it's a man's game, and sometimes when you lose and people are that passionate, that you can end up coming head to head, even if it is a manager and player. But it wasn't the greatest thing for me to do. Obviously, I then apologised, but I got helped to stay away from the club for a week. So I got a week suspension, which is fair enough, can it? He needs to show authority. And I was yeah, of course. Uh, so I didn't play I ended up missing a massive game where it was living I think we got to the it was either to get into the quarterfinals or in the quarterfinals against Hibs at Easter Road and uh, I had just come back into training that week and we had them at Easter Road on Tuesday and I missed I missed the game Poppy never put me in the squad but he made me come to the game and sit in the stand and watch the game and we get beat 3 2, and I was gutted because I thought if I was playing, who knows, man, could have won it. But that, that happens, and then uh, we get back to talking and stuff like that, but still wasn't too happy with me. So I was on the bench the next week for the Dunfermline game, and uh, I remember sitting on the bench watching it, and we were, we were all good, we were all good, we were handshakes and like that. I mean, hopping back to being best pals like we, we always won stuff like that. And, uh, Played them fairly and we were 3 0 down at half time. And he turned around and he looked at me and he looked at uh, who else was it he brought on? He brought on two players, I can't even remember who the second one was, but he brought me, brought me, turned around and said, Get warmed up, you're your own. I was like, ah, We're 3 0 down, we're 3 0 down, I'm your own here, man. I was thinking, I'm asking for my God, here we go, man. So I ended up getting brought on with them fairly 3 0. Thankfully, uh, thankfully, we never. We never lost any more goals that game, or else I could have possibly have seen another side of it that would be like I seen. But that was me, I was back in the team for then, and then, what, as I said, me and Hoppy had a great relationship. We used to cuddle at the end of a brigade, man, it was like a ritual kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> it's like one of those things, isn't it? Sometimes it's like, um, you know, I've spoken to like my greatest period of support in Sunderland was probably when Peter Reid was there. And the amount of arguments you hear about the players having with Reedy himself and the, you know, the head to heads, but I suppose in a way, and I've spoke to um, Alex Ray about this, who you'll know, sometimes it's about you can have those arguments and you can go head to head and you can fight tooth and nail with each other. But at the end of the day, no one from outside of your team or outside of your unit goes into that kind of fight because you've got each other's back. You can argue with each other, but no one else dares goes near you as a person from outside the camp. It's like that yeah. unity, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. Things like that, that stays in between the four walls. That's the main thing. It stays within the four walls. Whether it happens in there, if there's a wee fight, or, it's all men. You're all men in the changing room and sometimes things don't go your way or somebody might say something wrong in the heat of the moment and it, it can it can escalate and stuff like that. But it stays within the four walls and then the you're all teammates, managers, players, you're all one group. So you always stick together, you always have each other's back and to be honest, Hoppy had my back for everything. Yeah. Same as David Martin, the assistant manager, and obviously, as I said, the changing room at Livingston has always been great. As it was, you you know, you made the move to to Motherwell in the summer. Um, I think, as we've said, touched on before, it was such a, a fabulous season. But I think Stephen Robinson's reputation is just growing and growing and growing and growing. And I think people are really starting to see what him and Keith Lasley are doing. You know, how good has Stephen Robinson been as a manager for you? And also Keith Lasley is a, a duo, I suppose. Um, great, great for me. Uh, for the first minute that I met the gaffer, obviously, I went to the Dakota Hotel to meet him and Martin Foyle. And uh, at that time, I just had a chat with St. Johnston as well. So I had an all option at the table. And I met him and we had a conversation and uh, he was just telling me, oh, I've been a big admirer of you for a few years and stuff, but oh, you've really progressed. Uh, and he just said, but I can make you better. And he says, I can make you a better player, can make you a better defender. And straight away, that instantly, it's as if something just clicks with you and something sticks in your head and that stuck in my head. But I was like, I've never heard a manager come and say, I'll make you a better player when I try to sign you. It's as if, like, oh, you're a good player that comes in for us, but he was like, I'll make you a better player, I'll make you a better player. I was just thinking to myself, oh, that's 
a really bold statement that. So, but even the conversation that we had, him, my dad, uh, Martin Boyle, the enthusiasm that he was bringing, the, everything that he was bringing to the conversation was enthusiastic, which made me thought, this guy just really loves football and stuff like that, which made me think, like, I need that, I need that in my life, and you know? I need somebody that's buzzing about and it'll work well for me. So, it was a no brainer for me to sign for Motherwell, and then obviously the coaching staff there, right? obviously Laz and the gaffer, Morris Ross as well, uh, Dana Davies there at the start too, and then obviously you get Hinchy, the goalie coach, and Andy Bowles, the sports scientist. Being together are one of the best units I've, I've seen in football, to be honest, but. As I've said, I've, I've never had this before and I'll probably get a wee bit of a, a roasting for this for the boys, but as I've said before, I think the gaffer's the best manager in Scotland. It's a massive statement, but his attention to detail is phenomenal. And going on to a park, I've never had so much information going on to a park and knowing how to play my game as much as what I have since I went to Motherwell. And it made me a massively better player. And I think that's obviously proved with the fact that I got caught then how well Muller have ever done this season. And it's obviously it's a big thanks to him and the coaching staff as well. And obviously Laz, because Laz does a lot of drills with the defenders in the lead up, preparing to games and stuff like that. And Mo does a lot with the defenders as well. Gaffer does a lot with the defenders. It's always a time when you get individual time with one of them anyway. So it's never a case where you just come in, you're two as a group, you leave as a group. They're always individualised. Defenders will go with the lads, or defenders will go with the gaffer, or the goal. and they're always doing something. Or Hinch, even the goalie coach, coming in and taking the defence as well. How to play out to the back, how to defend, or how we can do this to stop a team or that. It's like them as a unit. It's unbelievable. And as I said, I keep using the same words: attention to detail. It's it's amazing, and that's the reason why Motherwell have been so successful. I think personally, it's just Keith Lasley's that good looking of a bloke. He just shell shocks other teams and just submit. How many the, the gaffer look the same? But how many the gaffer more? How many the gaffer more look the same? They've all got the grey hair with the wee black bits that get through and stuff like that. They need to just they need to let it go and just dye it all grey and that's it. Just accept it. Accept to be fair, it. to be fair with Keith, putting out the interview with Keith Lasley got me about 30, 40 female followers. Um, on the podcast so I kind of complained mate it was all around sort of the age of 45, 50 but they, they, were, they were firing in it was fine they were all just like oh, lastly I'll have some of that uh, all, the, all the grannies and stuff I love Lazzy <laughs> oh. housewife's favourite allegedly not my words not my words uh, <laughs> um as it is with Motherwell, you know, like people have really stood up and took notice of Motherwell this season. You know, I know it's really fresh news and that you're going to be in Europe and stuff like that. But, you know, when you look at the Motherwell's team now as well, you've got some really good young talent coming through. I mean, David Turnbull's obviously the, the standout, but, and I know it's previous, but um, there's a lad that I was watching that almost came to Sunderland this season. And obviously, he was at Oxford. Chris Cadden's another player that was there. It feels like Motherwell is starting to produce players, maybe the way people were seeing Hamilton in like a decade ago. And, and you know, Hamilton still do, but I mean, like probably Hamilton with the Scottish side where you'd see like the MacArthur's and the McCarthy's feels like Motherwell's that team now um, how excited are you at the age of what 28 now uh, 28, yeah. 29 um, how excited are you for the future of Motherwell because you've got like a good core of young lads coming through which are basically building or helping to build the spine of the team No it's definitely it's a massive thing at Motherwell and that was one of the things that I noticed when I, when I came to the club and I hadn't really seen it before the, the respect that the young boys get at Motherwell is massive like sometimes when you come into a club, you see that the young boys get kind of treated a wee bit unfairly at times. And it's not like that, but the young boys get treated very, very well. And they, when they come up to train with the first team players, they get treated like first team players. And sometimes they'll get coached more than the first team players, as in a sense, hey, they're wanting to progress them more into the first team than what they're bothered about even the first team players. So Youth development for Motherwell is massive. And obviously, like, Morris Ross being one of the, the top ones in the, the youth team and stuff like that, he's always pushing for his reserve boys, like, constantly in the gaffer's ear. And the boy Ross McIver that come on, Scott against Ross Cout and that, always in the gaffer's ear. Ross is looking really good. Like, look at Ross at training. And, like, he's always fighting the corner for the young boys. Obviously, there's a lot of young boys and our team in our squad training is every day. You've got, like, a Jamie Semple, 
David Devine, uh, Yusuf. Um, you've got a lot of young boys. And the best day of this day, I'm sitting saying you've got young boys like that. But realistically, we've got young boys playing in our first team just now with the likes of Alan Campbell. We've got the likes of, as you say, David Turnbull, Shell, And like most, most of the squad are all young, young boys. Do you know what I mean? Apart from the likes of me and Peter Hart and stuff like that. All <laughs> the, the old fogies. Me, Trevor Carlson. I'm, I'm chucking Trevor in there as well because he's not getting away with it. You know, your form this season, we've said, has been really good, I think on paper, and you might agree with me on this, it's been the, the best season of your career. I think it's hard to argue that. Um, you forced your reckoning into the Scotland squad. What's it like when you're pulling that Scotland jersey and you see like Gallagher on the back of your shirt and you're just like, I've done it? No, well, by you've just gave me goosebumps here, I think, about it. <laughs> <laughs> but there is, there is no better feeling. As a footballer, at the national stage, playing for your country, representing your country, it's just, there's no other feeling like that. And just that time, just coming in, and it was uh, and a part of the Russia squad. Obviously, I never played the Russia of the San Marino game, but just being there, being a part of the squads, the training sessions, what you do to the build up of that week, having your own share, the food that you get, being looked after the way you are, and then all leading up to going into Russia's national stadium, walking into the changing room, it's absolutely huge. It's bigger than God, half the houses that I've seen about here and stuff like that. <laughs> it's like you walk in there and then you get your own locker. It's got it's got all the technology in it, so you've got these screens and you've got things to charge your phone, and then your t-shirts just sitting there, and you're just thinking to yourself, "Wow, this is this is real." Like there's the Scotland tap there with Gallagher. It was number fifteen of us uh, for the Russia game, and it's just like this is this is crazy. It's like it's unreal, and then you're just looking about the changing room, and you're seeing the likes of Carl McGregor, and you're seeing the likes of John Fleck, Charlie Mulgrew, Robert Snodgrass, Andy Robertson. They're just sitting there like that. Wow, I'm, I'm, in this, I'm in the same team as these boys, you know, because sometimes you don't realise that, wow, I'm in the same team as well. Like Andy Robertson who's won the Champions League, and then Robert Snodgrass, Charlie Mulgrew, and guys like, oh, that's playing in the Premier League, John McGinn. It's just like, even though I've played against like a few of them and stuff like that, but still, when you've not done it in a wee while, you've not played against like the likes of John McGinn that way, and then you come into the team with them, the James Forrest, the Cam Reyes, you're just thinking to yourself, wow, like, these are my teammates and stuff like that. It's, it's a surreal, it is a surreal moment, and it was for me anyway. Maybe not so much then, but uh, <laughs> it was for me, obviously. Uh, it was a massive achievement, and uh, obviously, going out to do the warm-up in Russia, and I looked up and I seen my mum and dad obviously up in the crowd they managed to get a Russian visa within three days I think it's the first time it's ever been done in history getting a visa that quick but my mum and dad my dad never misses a game that's for sure never misses a game it doesn't matter where it is he'll never miss it and uh, yeah it was just amazing to see them up there waving down and stuff like that and you can just tell the joy that's in there and then obviously just knowing that my wife and my daughter were back home watching it as well and knowing how excited that my daughter would be anything she would maybe even see her glance at me on the TV or something it's just I've all that put together just that's why I always say it, it's like a dream come true because it's 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 hard to believe sometimes it actually happened it's funny you, you had me creased up the other day when you did the um, just to kind of take the, the the seriousness out of it a minute you creased me up the other day when you were on I think it was on pro clubs and just like first 15 seconds, I can't believe I'm playing pro clubs when I should be singing the national anthem against Israel. I was just like, that's peak, peak oh. hilarity. I had the oh. ticket for that game as well. I had a ticket for the Israel game. Um, but there it is. But oh, I've said that a million times. I've said that a million times. I've said a whole lot of tunnels and stuff like that, man, turning around and saying how man will play for the likes of Sarah and stuff like that. Now, how would I go to win the Champions League? <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's banter, awesome. isn't it? And final question is actually from a girlfriend here, right? She says, are we going to qualify or what? Well, definitely, I've got to qualify, yeah. Definitely going to qualify. Yeah, we'll take care of Israel and then, like, Haaland. Oh, yeah, Haaland. be all right. Don't worry about Haaland, don't worry about him. Gallagher versus Haaland, only one winner, mate, and it's Gallagher, isn't it? He'll, he'll be dealt with, don't worry about that. <laughs> Declan, that was uh, cracking. Thanks very much for your time, mate. I uh, wish you all luck in the future. And as always, thanks very much for your time, mate. No problem, mate. Cheers. Thanks very much for that. Thank you. Thank you.